For those of you who may have watched our services in recent months and maybe you don't quite understand uh, what's going on and why we're doing things the way we're doing things, um, let me explain to you so you can know. Tommy, my booby of 21 years, lost his job uh, a year ago November because of a bank buyout. He has been a vice president in his division uh, in a high-end management position for major bank for uh, over 20 years. <clears throat> his bank got bought out by a bigger entity. When they bought out his bank, uh, they did not need the high-level management people. So they gave them notice, thank God, and we knew for almost a year that his job would be coming to a close. So at least it wasn't something that was done secretly and suddenly, you know. We knew for almost a year that his position uh, was going to be coming to a close. But he could not uh, even seek employment during that year because in order to secure his severance package, uh, he had to work through the final day, so he couldn't afford to even apply for a job anywhere, just on the odd chance they would want him to work sooner, you know, and he would lose out on his severance. And after working for a company 20 years, you don't want to lose out on that, because it's, you know, a pretty good uh, chunk of change. And we needed that to help us for whatever time he might be out of work. Well, as it happens now, he's been out of work over a year, uh, as of November. And quite frankly, he's having a very difficult time uh, finding work. Uh, the economy suddenly decided to tank, and uh, the Fed began to raise rates and mortgage. Uh, the mortgage industry, as the Fed raises rates, the mortgage industry begins to suffer. As the mortgage industry begins to suffer, anybody who works in banking and mortgaging especially begin to be laid off. Well, next thing you know, there were thousands, and there still are daily, there are thousands of layoffs in the mortgage banking uh, segment of the uh, employed right now. So, uh, things are getting tough. Uh, any positions that might come available, there's a lot of competition. And unfortunately, my booby has reached the over-the-hill status. He is over 50, so we have to worry about ageism. Uh, he is an African American, we have to worry about racism. Uh, there's, a, you know, any number of obstacles that exist, but we believe that there is nothing too hard for God. So we're believing the Lord. In the meantime, we knew when he was going to, when his job was going to expire, we knew then that he was going to have to seek employment all over the country. Uh, the type of work that he does, the type of position that he uh, occupies, is not something that uh, you find a whole lot of need for, you know, ev in, in everywhere. You know, it, there's only so many people that do what he does in the entire country, never mind in any given city. Um, so therefore, we knew he was going to have to be applying in any number of cities around the country, and that we would likely have to relocate. When all this transpired, I accepted it as an act of God. I accepted it as the Lord causing the brook to dry up. If you remember, Elijah hid out from uh, uh, Jezebel and uh, the king uh, by a brook, and the Lord fed him there with uh, ravens. But then the brook dried up. And when the brook dried up, Elijah had to make different plans. He had to do something different. 
And God often uses our circumstances to redirect us. You know, uh, a lot of times people get so mad and they get so upset when things like this happen, but what they don't understand is the Lord's trying to put you in a new place, possibly even in a better place. And so instead of fighting it, you need to accept it as the will and mind of God and go with it. And say, okay, Lord, just guide my bark. Make sure my boat lands in the right port. So that's what we've been praying now for over, uh, honestly, over two years or about two years. We've been praying that the Lord would guide uh, him to a position somewhere that ultimately would be not only good for him professionally, not only good for us economically, financially, but also that it would be in a community that would respond positively. Uh, and matter of fact, if I don't mind saying overwhelmingly, to the ministry and the message of this old preacher. Amen. I know that this ministry is unique. Um, I know that it's unusual, and uh, I, I know that we're not like every other church and every other LGBT affirming church, and that's okay by me, because we are doing what we're supposed to be doing, okay? Uh, if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, fine, but I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm doing what God called me to do. So when we knew Tommy was going to lose his job, COVID was still in full swing. And we had already been doing our services as we're doing them now, broadcasting them this way. Now, when we had people coming to church, we broadcast even then. We've been doing this now for a number of years. Uh, however, when COVID came in and the government was recommending that uh, groups of people not meet or what have you. Uh, obviously, we abided by that. I saw no problem, no conflict with that. They were not silencing the church. They were not causing us to be unable to broadcast the gospel or to communicate with our members. That is not what happened. Uh, it just meant that for a time, we would not be able to physically meet in the same building. So... When the restrictions began to ease up and what have you, <clears throat> knowing that we're likely going to be moving, we really cannot invest in trying to build this work here right now because we don't know that a year from now we're not going to have to uproot and go somewhere else. And then we'd be leaving a bunch of people high and dry here. So the, the uh, people that we had coming uh, to church before COVID and everything, many of them said we'd be just as happy to watch uh, from home as we have been, you know, and just kind of continue the way we've been going. And this way, when you move, if you move now, if the Lord opens him a position here in Dallas, then we'll just start right back up again and, you know, go back into full swing and, and do what we're going to do. But if we have to move, we're not leaving people high and dry. That's the point I'm trying to make, okay? So the reason we're broadcasting our services the way we are right now is simple. We... Uh, are uncertain as to the direction that our ministry is going to be going in physically in the next several months or so. And therefore, we all felt it was wiser to simply uh, broadcast the service and all of our members locally, our extended members around the world. Uh, this ministry is blessed, you know. I was kind of feeling down this week. And go through one of my little struggles that I go through from time to time. And uh, I was looking at some things online. And uh, just honestly kind of lamenting that we didn't have the facility to work with. We didn't have things here in Dallas that I would have loved to have had. To be able to do a lot of the things that I would love to do <coughs> as a church. 
Uh, this preacher believes, folks, in ministry. I, I believe in ministry. I, I'm not a, I'm not about just preaching and having church services. Okay, a lot of churches, that's all it boils down to. They have church, they have Bible study, and that's all there is to the whole church. That is not how this pastor. That is not where my heart is. My heart is. Uh, there's a saying that I often use concerning my vision and, and how I approach things. And that is, I believe in ministering to as many people in as many ways as possible. Uh, I believe in ministering to as many people in as many ways as possible. And, uh, you know, different ministries serve different functions and they they serve different purposes this is one reason why i'm very old-fashioned pentecostal and i don't apologize for that i'm going to say something and get myself in a whole lot of hot water you're never going to see anybody running around waving banners in our church it's not ever going to happen i don't have time for that charismatic foolishness uh, you're never going to see a dance team performing dance in our worship services. The Word of God calls for worship that is in spirit and in truth. And spiritual worship is spontaneous worship. It is not rehearsed worship. It is not practiced worship. It is not... Um, I'm trying to think of the word I want to use. It's like going to a ball game. A spectator worship, okay? Um, spectator, spectators are not worshipers. If you come to church and you just sit there and watch everybody else worship, you're not a worshiper, okay? If you're not singing, if you're not clapping, if you're not uh, offering affirmation during the preaching, you know, you're not engaged in the process and things that require people to sit and observe, uh, like these dance ministries, you know, that they have, and this mind foolishness that they're bringing into the church. They're bringing this in as part of the worship. That's not worship. That's entertainment. Now, it may be inspirational entertainment, but it is still entertainment. And I'm not saying, now listen carefully for those of you who've already blown a cork over what this old-timey preacher just said. I'm not saying those things cannot have a, a function within the church. I'm not saying that they cannot be used in the church, okay? What I'm saying is they do not belong in the worship services. Now, having said that, if you're going to have a drama ministry, which is something I would love to do. As a young person, I was involved in drama myself. I love acting. I love drama. I love plays and musicals and this sort of thing. And one one vision that I've always held for our church is that one day we would have a facility and the fellowship portion of the facility, what's often called the fellowship hall, the dining hall, okay, would have a stage. And we would be able to stage plays and musicals and things of that nature on uh, in the fellowship hall, okay? Now, those things are spectator. But they're meant to be uplifting. They're meant to be inspirational. You know what I'm saying? So, therefore, if you want to use, like, dance worship uh, stuff, and if you want to use things like mime and everything, fine. That's where it belongs because it is strictly meant to be observed, okay? You don't participate in it, you observe it. So I have no problem with these things being used. <sighs> so anyway, I've always dreamed of one day having a drama ministry so that uh, our young people and our older people could be engaged in 
Look at this. Good grief. Could be engaged in uh, putting on place uh, people who are gifted in, in the area of writing. Uh, honestly, I've written over the years. I've written a number of plays myself. And one time, uh, I had written a play, and I submitted it to a couple of theater groups in New York City. And don't you know, uh, there was one theater group that wanted to do one of my plays, and uh, unfortunately, I had gone out of the country, and to make a long story short, there was kind of a tight timeline that they needed for me to approve them doing the play so they could do it for that season. And I didn't get back to them in time. And I, I, to this day, I've always regretted that because I would have loved to have seen the play read or, or performed however they were going to do it. So anyway, um, people in the church, you know, who are gifted at writing, could write plays and what have you. Uh, people in the church who are gifted artistically could create sets and create costumes and all this, you know. So it would give an outlet to members who want to be involved in such a ministry. And you know, you can really reach people and you can really inspire and uplift people and encourage people through live theater, you know. So that is one area of ministry that's always been just something I, I would love to do. Long story short, this week I was kind of going through the internet and looking at some things and honestly I, I was visiting websites for uh, some old friends that I've known over the years and seeing how they're doing these days and where their ministries are at. I told you folks, one thing about this preacher, I will always be transparent. I don't get up here and try to tell you I'm perfect when I'm not. I don't try to get up here and act like something that I'm not. The Bible said, confess your faults one to another, pray for one another that you may be healed. You can't pray for me for areas where I'm weak if I refuse to acknowledge I'm weak in certain areas. Did you get that? Okay. I can't pray for you in areas where you're weak if you're not free to confess that you're weak in certain areas, you know. So we ought, as children of God, we ought to be free to confess to one another, you know. Uh, we ought to be free to confess to the church that we have areas of weakness that we struggle with. And one of my areas that I really struggle with sometimes is... Uh, I can battle depression, at not, not, not nearly like I used to, but I can go through times of real bad depression and just kind of getting despondent and blue. And uh, if the enemy gets me in a mindset to compare, you know, compare where we're at or where I'm at today to where some of my old friends are at and stuff, then I'm in deep trouble because I'm, I'm not going to be a happy camper. To be honest, I'm being totally honest. And this week I was going through one of those sessions, you know, and then all of a sudden I started looking at some of our internet ministries. I started looking at our Facebook and I was looking at how many people are members of our Facebook groups that we have and our uh, YouTube channel and all this and I began to look and I realized I said, oh my Lord do you realize that when when you compare our Facebook and our outreach online to so many of these other churches uh, Many of these churches, the old friends of mine, pastor and what have you, they don't even have a YouTube channel. Nothing. They have no channel whatsoever. They don't videotape their services. They don't share their services online. And all of a sudden I'm looking and I begin to realize, okay, we don't have the facilities they have. We don't have the buildings they have and the campuses they have, which I would love to have still because there's so much you can do with that. But look at what we're doing in terms of online. Look at what we're doing. We're not just sitting back idle doing nothing. We're doing a lot. It's just mostly these days 
by reason of the internet. So we have many, many people around the world who follow this ministry. Many people contact me and they tell me that so far as they're concerned, uh, we are their church and I am their pastor. And they don't have a church where they live uh, that they're comfortable being a part of. And so they rely on this ministry for spiritual feeding and pastoral care. And that means when they have a prayer request, they either send me an email or they'll send me a, um, a text on the phone or a message on Facebook. And some people will even go so far as to call me on the phone if folks need counseling. Uh, they need to talk to somebody, they know they can call me. Uh, I just had a fella who was a member of our affirming work up north some years back contact me a few days ago and said, uh, would you be available to talk? And I said, certainly. So um, when we got on the phone, started talking, he told me where he's living right now. Uh, he does attend an affirming church where he's at. But he really doesn't have a whole lot of friends and a whole lot of uh, social contacts. And so he feels kind of isolated and alone. And uh, he said, you know, I, I thought maybe I could reach out by phone if that's all right. I said, that's fine. We talked for like five or six hours. <laughs> talked a long time. If that's what people need, that's what I'm here for. That's I'm happy to do that, okay? Um, I try to pastor our online folks the best I can. And if you need me to come, uh, and I'm going to make this little uh, side note here, you know, especially, especially for, for important occasions like a wedding or a funeral, okay, or even a baby dedication, or for that matter, water or baptism. If you need to be baptized in the name of the Lord and there is not a church locally that you can find that's willing or able to baptize you in Jesus' name, we try to help you find a church that will do it. But if for any reason you can't find a church, uh, I'll do everything in my power to get up there to you, to come to you and get it done. Okay, we'll get it done one way or the other. But if you want to dedicate your children if you want to uh, if, if you are in need of wedding being performed if you're in need of a funeral uh, please know that I uh, in those circumstances especially I will do everything in my power to be there for you okay we do not charge fees this ministry is not about making money I never have been I never will be it's not about charging fees Everything we ever do, we do on a free will offering basis. When I am invited to preach in other churches, and I've preached in a number of other uh, LGBT affirming churches over the last 30 years, we always go, and it's always from, uh, now I'm going to tell you, biblically, if you invite someone to come in and minister, you're obligated by the Word of God, just like our church is obligated by the Word of God, to give that person something. You don't, you don't give them nothing for coming in. But uh, I always go and preach wherever I'm invited, and uh, it is on a free will offering basis. The only thing I ask is that churches be honest, and truthful, not acting like Ananias and Sapphira, and saying, you know, um, oh, we're giving you the, the full free will offering that we took for you, when in reality, they're taking a portion or a good part of it back and putting it back in their own pocket. I've had this happen, folks. Uh, even in affirming churches, I've had this happen. And then I've had pastors get upset with me because the Holy Ghost showed me that they had done this. And when I mentioned it to them, they got angry and upset that they got called out on it. But uh, 
I go on my own time, okay? I pay my own airfare, I pay my own car rental, I'll pay my own hotel, I don't care. If you invite me to come preach, I will go and I will pay everything out of my own pocket because that's what God's called me to do. But when you take a free will offering, just like we do here, we give the minister we take that offering for the entire offering. You don't hold back part of it. Oh, well, we need to pay for the meeting room. We need that. No, no, no. Those kind of things you need to address beforehand. Uh, in other words, you need to, to either, you know, do a fundraiser, do what you have to do to make sure you have that paid for before the minister comes. You don't get up in front of the congregation and beg and plead the people that give for Brother Charles and then turn around and take half that and put it in your pocket. Do you follow what I'm trying to say? I'm talking about ministerial, ministerial integrity, okay? And you might be saying, well, Pastor, I don't know why you're talking about that. Well, you and I both. But I'll tell you what I've learned. Without fail, when I do this, without fail, somebody later contacts me and says, boy, I'll tell you, you don't know how much I needed to hear that, you know? There may be some minister out there who's part of the LGBT community and maybe you don't have the training, maybe you don't have the experience, uh, maybe you haven't had the opportunity to understand and learn how these things are supposed to be done. But just like any giving from a biblical perspective, give and it shall be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. When a church blesses visiting ministers, God blesses that church. Haven't you heard me say that? How many times, Booby, in this church have I said that? So therefore, if I take an offering for a visiting minister, and it's ten times any offering I've ever taken in this church, it goes to that visiting minister. I'm not going to stand there and say, well, bless God, when we take offerings for our own church, we only collect $100. How is it we collected $500 for this person? You know, it doesn't matter. The Lord may be using your church to meet a need for that uh, individual or for that ministry. And you're being a blessing to them is only going to bring blessing back to you. Dozens and dozens of LGBT affirming churches have started and closed since I began my affirming ministry in 1993. 2023 marks 30 years that I have been in LGBT affirming ministry. I've been doing this for 30 years. I want to tell you, you know, I believe strongly in integrity. I believe strongly in ethics. I believe strongly in ministers behaving like men and women of God and upholding morality and decency and being ethical in their conduct. Now I'm going to tell you, I'm, again, I'm going to be honest and then I'm going to move on with the service. I am not today where I was 30 years ago. Anybody who can stand in front of you and say, that they're the same person they were 30 years ago, I'm going to tell you, that person's something wrong with them. There is something really wrong with somebody who is the same 30 years later. I have grown, I have progressed, I have matured, I have advanced, I have gotten things under control, to be frank and honest, that for a period of time in my life I did not have under control. Uh, a lot of things have changed. If you're watching this video right now and you knew me 
uh, 20 years ago. Got news for you, I'm not the same person I was 20 years ago. If you're somebody watching me right now and you knew me 10 years ago, got news for you, I'm not the same person I was 10 years ago. No, we are constantly, if we're healthy, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Outside of me, you can do nothing. If you're plugged into the vine and you're healthy, then you are growing and you are bearing fruit. Amen? Mm -hmm. So I'm here to tell you today, uh, I am growing and I am not the same person that I was. My ministry grows. I talk to Tommy all the time about... Uh, about changes and about doing things a little different. You know the old saying, if you keep doing things the same way, you're going to keep getting the same results. So you, if you're not getting good results, then only a, a fool continues to do things the way he's been doing them. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. Amen. So anyway, uh, so I just wanted to share a few thoughts with you at the beginning of the service today. I'm going to ask Tommy to come at this time, and he is going to read for us our declaration of purpose, and then we'll continue with our service from there, okay? Our declaration of purpose. It is the purpose of this ministry to reach out to a lost and dying world with the wonderful news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We purpose to welcome and affirm all people without regard to age, race, skin color, nationality, land of origin, first language, sexual orientation, gender identification, professional or financial status. We believe that faith in the gospel is what identifies a child of God, not adherence to any creed or compliance with any code or mandate. We believe all who sincerely seek to know and serve the Lord in truth are welcome at the Master's table without exception. The message of the gospel is rooted in grace, love, and compassion. We purpose to demonstrate and function within these things. We purpose to minister to everyone who is in need, spiritual or material. We purpose to feed the hungry, visit the sick, encourage the imprisoned, provide for the poor, clothe the naked, house the homeless, nurture and guide the young, care for the elderly, comfort the dying, and embrace those hurt and rejected by their own families and faith communities. If you have entered this church today having been wounded or offended by others who call themselves Christians, please know for a fact that here you are welcomed, loved, accepted, affirmed, and safe. Our purpose is summed up in all, excuse me, our purpose is summed up in these pass passages from God's Word one of which is Matthew 25, 34 through 40. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye, be, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we, saw we thee sick, or in prison, or came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Praise the Lord. That is our statement of purpose, which we hope to share at the beginning of every service. 
uh, or at least every Sunday uh, morning service if we should ever go to a morning evening schedule because we want to make clear, absolutely clear, to every visitor, every first time uh, visitor, we want to make clear to everyone what our purpose and our mission is. Amen. We want to go to the Lord in prayer as we begin our service today. Remember, Tommy and I, please, this ministry still needs direction, and our direction, uh, at the moment anyway, is directly tied to his uh, job situation. And uh, so, you know, if the Lord changes, um, if the Lord should change certain situations, I don't know how to say this, for instance, if the Lord dropped a bunch of money out of heaven tomorrow, then we could simply find a new place to go and go, and then Tommy could find a job there, okay? Um, but in the meantime, right now, we have to do it where Tommy's job is kind of the, the guiding force, you know. So we're, we're waiting for him to find a position so we know where we're going. Um, I must tell you, I have been doing a lot of research this past year. I've been researching a, a number of communities uh, based on a, a number of criteria uh, that I'm looking at. I'm looking at the populations. I'm looking at the racial mix of the population. I'm looking at the uh, economic condition of the community. Uh, not that that's a, a deciding factor, because quite frankly it's not. Like I told Tommy the other day, I said, the Lord may send us somewhere that's flat, poor, broke, because he wants us to help elevate it, you know. So by no means am I saying that, you know, economics is a deciding factor. It is not. But we're looking at a number of places, and the reason I'm doing this is, uh, I, I believe in being prepared. I was a Boy Scout as a kid. And as a kid, uh, Boy Scouts' motto was, be prepared, you know. And Booby's smiling at me, that means I'm carrying on, and he's saying, I thought you were done with all this talking. I can read him like a book. He thinks I don't know him, but I know him. But, uh, you know, I believe in being prepared, okay. And so, therefore, I'm looking at places all over the country. I'm researching cities and communities all over the country. Every time he mentions a job that he's applying for, whatever community he mentions, I go and immediately I start investigating that community. I want to know the racial mix. I want to know the politics of that community. I want to know uh, if it leans liberal, if it leans uh, conservative, because honestly, you would think anyway that a church like ours, now some might say, oh, you all would do beautifully in a, in a really liberal environment. No, we would not. Mm -mm. No, we would not. Been there, done that. Okay, I spent like six years or eight years in New York City. And my ministry is not, I think my ministry is not a ministry that went over very well in New York. Now at the time, I'll be honest with you, at the time, I really was fledgling to affirming ministry, so uh, I really was a lot harder sounding and a lot, and there were a lot of things I hadn't worked out yet, okay? And I admit that. So therefore, I'm, I could be entirely wrong. Maybe if we went to New York tomorrow, we would do fantastic. And if God opens the door and sends us to New York, I'm going to go to New York, all right? But I'm saying that for the most part in a, in a very, very liberal environment, number one, you tend to find more atheism, agnosticism. You tend to find people who are more inclined toward uh, uh, meditation and Buddhism, okay? You tend to find people who are more inclined toward what I call hyper, uh, hyper uh, grace theology which is your universalist uh, doctrine and that sort of thing. Our ministry walks a very fine line, and I've been saying this for years, we walk on a razor's edge. 
because in many ways we are pretty liberal, okay? Socially, social issues, politically, we're pretty liberal. But theologically, we fall more toward the conservative side in that we are, I hate to use this word because it has such a negative connotation attached to it these days, but we are an evangelical church, folks. We are. We believe humanity is lost and needs to be saved, and therefore we evangelize. We're trying to win the lost, okay? That's what an evangelical church is supposed to be. It's not supposed to be a hyper-partisan political machine. That's not what the, the evangelical means. But we are theologically an evangelical church. We do believe without apology that Jesus Christ is the singular way to God. We do not believe that all roads lead to Rome. Now we have a position on some issues that's quite a lot different than most of your evangelical churches when it comes to eternal punishment and that sort of thing. So we don't hold quite to the same ideas, you know, hellfire and brimstone for everybody and anybody, you know. We don't quite hold to the same exact view as they do. We do believe that the lost will spend eternity separated from God. They will not be walking in the same relationship with God that the saints are going to walk in, okay? They will not have access to the New Jerusalem. Uh, all these wonderful things that God has promised for those of us who are born again. But we walk a very fine line. So what happens is we have many people in the LGBT community who aren't interested in us because we're too, we're too spiritually and uh, doctrinally conservative, you know. And that reminds them too much of the hateful, negative, nasty stuff they come out of, okay? Unfortunately, I don't think they listen to us carefully enough to understand where we're different in that regard, okay? But there's a number of people on the straight side, the non-LGBT, who actually love our ministry and support our ministry, as well they should, because they too understand our mission, and they too have been hurt, ostracized, set aside, judged, condemned, criticized by the mainstream church. And in our church, they're able to understand grace as it's meant to be understood. And they're able to walk with God. They're able to walk in victory to the extent that uh, they know that salvation is not about themselves, but about Him. Mm -hmm. It's not You're not going to be saved because anything you did, you're going to be saved because of what He did for you. Amen. Amen. So, uh, you know, our ministry walks a real fine edge. So anyway, so in my mind anyway, a, a community maybe that leans liberal or is a little more liberal uh, than conservative probably would be a better fit for us. But we cannot afford to be completely uh, separated from the more conservative side because not everybody who identifies as a conservative is a social conservative fanatic. And this is a mistake, again, that a lot of people in the liberal side of politics and in the liberal side of society make. A lot of people, and I've learned this over the years myself, a lot of people who identify as conservative or identify, frankly, as Republican, if you talk to them, they will tell you, I believe in conservative fiscal policy, and that is their main concern. Keep taxes low. Don't, you know, don't, don't bring taxes up so we're like... Europe, where they're paying 40% of their income in taxes, you know, don't do that. And of course, that means they believe in tight controls on government and, you know, and what have you, okay? 
But a lot of times these same people are supportive of LGBT community, they're supportive of gay marriage, they're supportive of a woman's right to have power over her own body. You know what I'm saying? So uh, unfortunately they don't realize that they keep voting Republican in order to get the fiscal policies that they want, but they don't realize how it's hurting a lot of people because married to that within that party is all this negative stuff toward many segments of our population women people of color LGBT people so on and so forth so anyway our ministry reaches those people who may be fiscally conservative but they're they're socially more on the liberal side and we're able to build bridges, folks. I'm telling you right now, if you understood how many non-LGBT people over the years, and LGBT people for that matter, have come at it from two different angles. I've had people who are non-LGBT who told me, you have no idea how much you have opened my eyes and helped me to understand LGBT people, LGBT issues, LGBT sexuality and, and gender identification, you know. And then on the same on the opposite side, on the LGBT side, I've had people tell me, and several people for that matter, you have no idea. I used to have so much trouble with my teenagers. I used to have so much trouble with my kids because I came out as LGBT and that created a rift in my family and it created trouble and ever since we've been coming to your church they have come to understand LGBT issues and blah 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 and now we have peace in my home and now they're more supportive and now they understand better do you know what I'm saying so so we're in a position to build bridges between should I say the two extremes and for that reason, I wouldn't want to be in a, quote, liberal haven. I'd like to be somewhere where there's, you know, kind of a decent balance, you know. And so anyway, I've been researching all kinds of communities and things. And, you know, if the Lord were to open the door financially for us, or if somebody in one of these communities suddenly called me and said, hey, I've got a church building here that I'm willing to let you have or I'm willing to let you use. See, in all the years I've been in affirming ministry, nobody has ever offered us nothing. I'm going to tell you something right now, folks. Nobody. I know churches here in Dallas that have been meeting for decades in space that was donated to them. Okay? We're apostolic. We're not mainstream, Trinitarian. If we were, we probably would have stuff thrown at us like this, okay? We're apostolic. We have not had one single thing thrown at us or given to us or handed to us. Every meeting space we've ever occupied, every one of them, we've had to pay for. Well, the problem is, because we have to pay for it, and because we are new and you know trying to get our feet underneath us, we don't have the budget for a space in Oak Lawn. I would love a space in Oak Lawn. When we have had space in Oak Lawn, we've actually done pretty well, haven't we? Mm -hmm. The problem is, the only space in Oak Lawn we ever could afford was either meeting in a, a city parks facility, which means we have to go in and set up and break down, and, you know, after every service, and, and or if we could get a space we could call our own. It was tiny, it was crowded, we had very little uh, flexibility in how we could use the space. Basically all we could do was church and Bible study, which remember I said, that's not, that's not my vision. Well, that's all we could ever do. Or we would wind up in Oak Lawn, but we'd be off on Maple Avenue somewhere, which is not, you know, the better streets in Oak Lawn. And we were in a building that was falling in on itself, you know. I mean, this is what happens when you have such a limited budget, you know, and you're working with such tight 
uh, finances and nobody is offering you any help. Nobody's offering us meeting space or anything for free, okay? So we've had to pay our way every step of the journey. We have paid rents <clears throat> that have been two and three thousand dollars a month at times. Add to that uh, utilities and all this other, and we were paying uh, four thousand plus a month. And uh, oftentimes when that was happening, Tommy and I, at the time he was working, uh, we would have to make up the difference ourselves. And uh, that happened a lot for many, many years. And then there were times when we were able to get like a storefront in uh, the Oaklawn area and we set up a thrift shop. At one point we had the thrift shop in one storefront and a shopping, a two-story shopping plaza and then the church was on the second story, you know. And we had a space for the church on the second story. But in order to pay for us to have a meeting space, this preacher had to work 40 to 60 hours a week for free in a thrift shop. And all the work I did was not so I could go home with a salary of even $20,000 a year. No. Everything I did was so the church could have a meeting space. And again, again, the meeting space we had was still, even though it was nice and comfortable and, you know, it wasn't real tight and everything, but it could only basically be used for church services and Bible studies. You see, we never had a facility with a fellowship hall that we could use for different outreach events or different fundraising events and that sort of thing. We never had that. So if the Lord opened the door for us to go into a community where we could afford to get a facility that would have the resources uh, that we need to do the work we want to do, then I would do it. And quite frankly, I would drag Tommy there by the ears and I would say, now Booby, we're here. We're here for the work of God. You just find a job, whatever job you can find. And, and honestly, I'm serious. That's how I would approach it. And he knows I'm telling the truth. Uh, but right now, we're still using his job situation as our guide, okay? And waiting on the Lord. All right.